feel like we've already done what we needed to do here today, quite honestly. Uh, let me just throw a little cherry on top for our next moments together um, and just open up the word of God with you guys. But before we get into all that, maybe throughout the 21-day fast, you were a part of uh, our services on Sunday night from 6 to 7. It's called Overflow. And what we've done and what we've been doing is just coming in this room and what we experienced just a minute ago, we do that the whole time. So we minister to the Lord through our worship and through our submission to him and allowing the Holy Spirit to show up and just kind of direct that hour. And that's why we call it overflow because it's an overflow of what God has done here in this moment, in this morning. So I invite you guys back. And so if you have kiddos, they're allowed to come in here. There's nothing more beautiful than seeing kiddos being raised in the house of the Lord. Let their mom, let them see their moms and their dads and their grandparents worship in Jesus. That makes an indelible impact on their lives too. So tonight, six o'clock, six to seven, or to wherever God just tells us to stop. And uh, we do that every Sunday night. So you're invited to that. The other thing is we do the exact same thing on Wednesdays from noon to one. So if you on your lunch hour want to cruise over here, worship the Lord, sit and just let him minister to you. We also pray towards specific things that we feel is important to God's heart. So we'll pray for one another, but we also pray for our city, our elected officials. We pray for our country. We pray for just whatever God puts on our heart. And so uh, we want to invite you to that as well. So we're going to keep doing this because we actually are really into this Jesus thing. Isn't that weird? so strange for a church to be into Jesus. It's weird. If you're new here, you're going to find that I'm a warped man. And, um, and so if you're new here, we want to welcome you guys. And we really want you to feel at home. That's just our heart. And uh, one of the ways that we're going to just express that right now is we're not going to meet you, meet your neighbor. How many of y'all been, you know what I'm talking about? When you ever been to a church, we're like, turn around and tell the person next to you how good looking they are. Let's take two minutes and shake hands. That was the first thing I killed as soon as I showed up here. No more meet and greet. No more. So the introverts in the room, you're welcome. All right. Why don't we pray and see what God now has to say about some stuff. Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, that the praises of your children, your word says that you inhabit the praises of your children. So, Lord, thank you for inhabiting our praise, taking what we have offered up to you as your children. We love you. We want to love you more. We want to serve you more. We want to know you more. And so, Lord, I thank you that you have created a space for us here today and for those listening online, Lord, to be able to say yes to you, Jesus, and learn how to do that more and more in every area of our lives. And so we ask now, Lord, come Holy Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us, awaken hearts, Open minds. May your grace and your mercy be manifest in this hour so that all may know the goodness of God. It's in the name of Jesus we all said together. Amen. Amen. So if you haven't been with us, we've been in this series called The Blueprint. And really, it's kind of like a part two from the first series we did at the beginning of the year, A Fresh Wind, where we looked at the Holy Spirit and his role in our lives. But then we jumped over to Acts chapter two in this new series, because once people are filled with the Holy Spirit, we see that the Holy Spirit begins to move within a community that's just like us, all different backgrounds, all different types of experiences, different heritages and countries and skin color and everything else. And the Holy Spirit, scripture says, he then when, a holy, when we submit to the Lord, we receive him and his salvation, what happens is, is our identities for what we were known for and what we, were, what we didn't want to be known for, all of that died and was buried at the cross by the blood of Jesus. And we become new creations in Christ. And scripture says that when we say yes to Jesus in faith for salvation, we are no longer Jew or Gentile. We're no longer slave or free. We're no longer even considered male or female. Scripture says we are in Christ. We have a brand new identity. And so I want to say that to somebody in here because maybe you feel like you're a bad Christian. There's no such thing unless you're trying to do it on your own effort. The Bible says that he's declared you righteous. He's declared you holy. He's declared you a son and a daughter of God because Jesus paid it all and is not by our works lest any of us should brag about it. So there's no such thing as a bad Christian. Now, there may be a, such a thing as a disobedient Christian, but we'll cat tackle that the other day. Today, I'm going to encourage you, r just tons. Y'all ready to be encouraged today? Or do you want me to just spit fire like that fireplace we just saw on the screen? All right. A little extra for the 10 o'clock service. You're welcome. Who gets a crackling fire at 10 o'clock in the morning at church? You do. You're welcome. 
Our tech crew worked so hard to set the stage for you guys to be able to worship. Can we just give it up for our tech crew? Uh, the only time you know that they're doing their job is when they've not done it. Outside of that, they're invisible. And it's only when they mess up that we go, oh, is there a tech crew back there? Who's pushing those buttons? They work so hard. And every Sunday, they do, they're flawless. And so, man, we're so thankful for them. So, tech crew, you get a double portion of love this morning. Thank you. Seriously, thank you, guys. Y'all are the bee's knees, as the kids say. The kids do not say that whatsoever. <laughs> Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. He moves in us. He begins to change our understanding of what it means to live life and to interact with one another and to step into our purposes. And so what we've been looking at is the blueprint of this church that started in Acts chapter 2. Because we're a relatively new church. We launched officially as Great Oaks Fellowship in September. And so what we want to do is we don't want to allow our past experiences, our preferences, even traditions to inform what God is doing here. What we want to do is we want the word of God to inform the type of church he wants to build here on this property. And when I say build, I'm talking about us. We are the church. It's not these walls and the ceiling. It's what he wants to do within us. And so God says when the Holy Spirit begins to move, this is what the type of church I built. And he begins to talk about as he rolls out the blueprints of his word in Acts chapter 2, we begin to see what I'm calling load-bearing walls. It's a construction term. Anytime you build a structure, you have to have support. Otherwise, that structure, as beautiful as it may be, will begin to collapse. It has to have immovable load-bearing walls in order for it to last the, the test of time. And so the Bible highlights a handful of load-bearing walls. These are the things and the tenets by which we want this church to be built because this is how God wants to do it. Because God has great plans in store. So we don't want to move. We don't want to mess with things. And so with the first load-bearing wall that we looked at was the load-bearing wall of walking in our identity. The church, us, we must understand and know who God says we are and who he's called us to be. Because if we don't collectively understand who we truly are as sons and daughters of God. We will always be an anemic Christian. We will be an anemic body. We will sing about things we never experienced. We will read about things we never experienced. And that is not God's will for your life. What the enemy wants to do, since you've said yes to Jesus, he can't take you with him to hell. Okay? Because Jesus' blood has released you from judgment. It's good news this morning. It's good news, best news. However, if the devil goes, okay, well, I didn't get you that way, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to anesthetize you and make you feel like you're missing something. I'm gonna make you feel like you're lesser than other Christians in the room. I'm gonna make you feel like you just ought to be grateful you're saved and don't expect anything more from God. Many of us in here can relate to that, can we not? And so when we go, the, so what he wants to do is he just wants to pat you on the head and keep you sleepy because the moment the church begins to take the word of God seriously and read it for themselves, we will begin to discover the true authority and identity that God has given us. When that happens, when a group of believers in a body of local believers like us, when we begin to walk in who God says we are through Christ and not what we see in the mirror, we shut down the attacks of the enemy and all of a sudden we are a threat. Because if we know who we are, we can pursue all the things that God says we can become. That's the truth of it. That is a load-bearing wall. And so, listen, most of my sermons, you can reduce them down to two things, grace and identity. Because if we can capture those things as sons and daughters of God, we will be able to fulfill our purpose and our destiny. So that is a load-bearing wall. Jesus loves you in Christ. There ain't nothing you can do about it. And you have just as much Holy Spirit in you as I've got. Now, that may not be encouraging for some of you. You're like, oh, <laughs> thanks. All right, keep going, David. Next load-bearing wall, Pastor Kurt talked about biblical community. This is a load-bearing wall. When God builds his church, he did not design his body of believers to live this life of faith independently and by ourselves. We are not called to do that. That is a load-bearing wall where biblical community is critical for the structure and the support of the church that God wants to build. We need one another. 
We need one another and we need to be with one another because our yes to Jesus is informed largely outside of the Bible and the Holy Spirit in biblical community. We have to have these fellowship groups. We need to get to know each other's names and each other's stories and know how to learn to support and cheer one another on. God designed it that way because it's a family, not just a bunch of spectators or consumers. The church must have biblical community, and that has to be an immovable wall here. So we will continue to challenge you and call you into biblical community because the Bible says so, and we want our church to look like the Acts 2 church, the blueprint that God's laid out, right? Then last week we talked about that really the third immovable wall, the load-bearing wall, is honoring and worshiping the Lord with your best and your first through the giving of your tithes and your offerings, Scripture is so clear about this, not because God needs your money. He wants your heart. And this is one of the main areas for all of us that we probably struggle with the most in surrendering it to the Lord. But God says, this is an immovable wall. This is a load-bearing wall. He has designed the church to support itself through the family. Not just so that we can keep the lights on, although that does help, but it's so that we can worship through our giving of our tithes and our offerings, which is 10%. And what I shared last week is that I'm encouraging you to give your 10% to the Lord because he says to do it. And he says, test me, I'll out bless you. You can't out give God, okay? Give him something to bless. But I encouraged you guys and I challenged you guys to also take an extra 1%, stick it in a bank account and let it sit there. And then as the Lord reveals to you personally, Areas or people that you want to be able to, who are in need, they need a new tire for their car. Maybe you're inspired to buy the coffee of the person behind you in Starbucks and pass a little invite card to our church. You'll have the money to be able to bless people. And so those are your offerings. And so guys, that's when it gets super fun. We worship God through our 10% by giving it to our local church. If you call this your home, that's what God expects. But save at least that 1%, stick it over there. It is so fun. I'm not even kidding you. It's the best thing ever. But that was last week's sermon. Listen to that online. This week, so identity, biblical community, obedience through giving to God, non-negotiable. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. It really is. This week, we're going to talk about gifts. And I want to open up by reading this passage of scripture, especially in light of the fact that we just did baby dedications. But check this out. Psalm said this. You, who, God, you saw who you created me to be before I even became me. It goes on to say, before I had ever seen the light of day, the number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. Don't ever think anymore that you're an accident and that you have no purpose. Don't ever think that again. If you're a son and a daughter of God, God's not now, okay, great. They said yes to me for salvation. Okay, that's good. Now what am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to give them the spiritual gift of like sweeping floors. Although that's a wonderful job, but please don't. But do you know what I'm trying to say? It's not like God's just trying to figure out to keep us busy before we die and go to heaven. That's not what this is about. This should let each and every one of us know that God sees you. He loves you uniquely and specifically. He is intimately aware and involved in the next breath that you're about to take. Your next heartbeat is because the Lord says yes to it and gives you another one. He is in love with you and he has a plan for you and he knew you before you became you is what the Bible just said. You matter to the Lord. He cares for you. There was this church in this movement as we begin to see the Acts Church begin to develop and begin to spread. And people are moving elsewhere and they're starting churches. Well, there's this little city called Corinth, right? And there's, a, there's basically, they're in a similar season that we're in. They're starting a new season, a new church, and they're just trying to figure things out. Well, there's this guy named Paul who wrote this letter and he began to talk about this load-bearing wall that has to be set in place for the church to stand the test of time. And this is what he says. He says, I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts that he has given you now that you belong to Jesus Christ. Now, did you catch that? He says, now that you belong to Jesus Christ, I thank God for the gifts that he's put in each and every one of you. 
It's an assumed thing. He understands that when we say yes to Jesus for salvation, God awakens and places within us the purpose and the destinies and the callings within us to be able to step into something more than just exist as Christians. But look at what it says. It says, through him, God has enriched your church in every way with all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. He goes on to say, this confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual what? gift, right? You need as you eagerly wait for the return of Jesus Christ. So when you say yes to Jesus for salvations, he's not calling you to twiddle your thumbs and just try to be good boys and girls between now and the rapture or you die. He says, no, 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 no. I've put something in you and you get to use them as you wait for the day where you stand before the Lord. So there's something God has called each and every one of us to participate in, and it seems scripture is calling this a gift. Notice he doesn't say chores. He doesn't say have tos. He doesn't say if it's convenient and works within your schedule. There's a gift, a gift, a true gift to someone who went, I love you, I know you, I put forethought into this gift, and I want you to have it. That's what a real gift is. When it comes to understanding our spiritual gifts, here's what I would tell you. We have to understand right on the front end of this whole thing. Your gifts help achieve your life's purpose when you use them. When you use those gifts, okay? I heard recently, and I'm going to butcher the quote because it's not in my sermon notes, but basically here's the essence of it. Basically, what I, what I, yeah, yeah, that this is how it went. Basically, they said the most expensive property on the earth are cemeteries because the unwritten songs, the unwritten books, the people that never got loved by this person, the, the, the ways by which they were able to change the world is in that grave and they were never awakened and used. We think we're going to live forever in some sort of weird way. We think, oh yeah, that'd be then. But but I need to get through the season first. I've got to try to get my stuff together first. You know what? Once the kids move out of the house, then me and my husband can do this. Then we could step into the things. We will kick the gift up the road like a can, and that can's going to get buried with you and never get opened. Today's the day that we step into what God designed us for because he knew us before we became us. That means he's got a plan and a purpose for your life today. And I can already hear the objections. We'll get there. I'm a professional. I'll take care of you, okay? Nobody believes that I'm a professional, I just learned. Okay. It's like karaoke preaching. What is that what you think I'm doing up here? Let's get into it. 1 Corinthians 12 says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities that the Spirit gives us. Once again, there's an assumption here. Everybody knows this. Each and every one of us in here who know Jesus, we should know that Jesus, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, has given us gifts. Your special abilities that the Spirit gives us. I don't want you to misunderstand this is what he says. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we all serve the same Lord. So regardless about your, of your, your unique giftedness and your unique calling, it all points and funnels into the glory of God. We serve one Lord. We don't serve our opinions. We don't serve what we like. We serve the Lord with our gifts and our special abilities. Unique. God works in different ways, he goes on to say. But it's the same God who does the work in all of us. You catch that? We don't serve the Lord because he needs our help. He's God all by himself. And guys, this church will thrive. It will blow up. There will be amazing things that happen here, even if I'm not here. This is not David Martin's show. If the Holy Spirit is submitted to in this church, you can have Bozo the Clown up here, but if he's filled with the Holy Spirit and he's obedient to the Lord, your life will be impacted and we will impact the nations through this ministry. So it's not David Martin. I'm honored to be here. Please, Lord, let me be here a super long time. But the truth is, 
God works in different ways, but it's God who does the work here. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can do something. What does it say? So that we can help each other. Isn't that what families are supposed to do? I'm not going to say, isn't this what families do? Because we all know it's, it's give or take, right? But we're supposed to help one another, serve one another, pick up the slack where the other one can't. Maybe even do things that the other person should be doing, but they're too lazy to do it. Parents, you all feeling me on that one? Right? I'm just kidding. Not really. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest, now look at this. I appreciate that Paul brings this up because I think sometimes we idolize these types of expressions of service to the Lord. Oh, I got to be on a stage. That's where you can serve the Lord and everybody else just has to sit there and enjoy it. We think that we, we, we prioritize these gifts in a way that isn't biblical. What I'm doing right now is no more significant to God and the kingdom than what you're doing if you're obeying him and walking in your gifts. Zero difference. The least important parts of the body that seem the weakest and the least important are actually the most necessary is what he said. So the way that we categorize gifts, we probably got it backward. It seems to imply that the guys who yell in the microphone with ADHD and have no hair are really not the most important people after all. <laughs> David Martin version. But listen to this. And the parts we regard less honorable are those that we actually clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this kind of special care. So he's saying, you get what he's talking about? Read between the lines. There's some things that need to be covered. And as a pastor, thank you for doing that today. Thank you. We have to take, this is what the Bible says, we have to take care. But the ones that are seen are actually maybe not the most important after all. So God put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to these parts that have less dignity. This makes for something, guys. Scripture says this makes for what? Harmony. Harmony. You don't have to be a musician to hear when something is not in harmony. If someone was playing in a different key up here and the whole, everyone else was singing a different, in a different key, you would know inherently something isn't right. Something is not in harmony. This makes for harmony for among the believers so that all the members care for each other. Check this out. Oh, I love this, guys. God is so good. He doesn't have to do it this way, but he does. He goes, so if one part suffers, all of us suffer with it. So you don't have to sit in isolation at Great Oaks Fellowship and feel like you have to suffer in silence and suffer in isolation. I want to let you know, this church, I can't speak for any other church, I can speak for this one. When we open those big red doors on a Sunday, anybody can walk in here and discover the love of Jesus. And often the way that that happens is by how well we love the weaker ones that walk through the door. We don't judge them. We don't shoot the wounded. We don't judge the wounded. We receive them and let it be a house of healing and a hospital for the soul so that they can experience what you claim to have. That's what this is about. It's the body of Christ. It's the body of Christ. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. So guess what? Anything good that happens here, you can high five yourself and go, I played a part in that. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. So when God builds his church, okay, this is what it's supposed to look like. So as Great Oaks Fellowship continues to move into this new season that God has been so gracious to invite us into, this is a load-bearing wall. We are here for each other, we support one another, and we use the gifts and the callings and the passions that he's placed within us to be awakened by the Holy Spirit, used for one another's blessing for the glory of God. I cannot say it any better than that. I wish I'd recorded that. That was masterful. Write that down or listen back to it. Not because I'm awesome, but because this is so true. If we grasp this, do you know what could happen? Anything could happen. Here's a, here's a problem, okay? If you look at churches, part of my job as a pastor is I, I read studies, and I'm, I'm always trying to just stay on the front end of what culture is doing and how it affects the church and vice versa. And one of the studies that came out is studies show that churches like ours, but not our church specifically, because you guys 
are on the other side, on the plus side of what I'm about to share. But on average, across the United States, only 10% of the people who actively attend church actually use their gifts for God. 10%. Let's say there's 350 people in here. That means about 35 of you, statistically speaking, are serving. The 90% sit in a chair and they take those gifts, gifts right to the grave. That isn't right. In light of what we just read, doesn't that make you feel kind of gross? It does me. But I used to be one of those 90 percenters. I used to be one of those 90 percenters for a variety of reasons. But I've learned my greatest joys in life has been serving the Lord. And it hasn't always been preaching. I love mowing grass. I'm a sicko. I'm like, I'm like, I cannot wait till March so I could start just mowing that brown grass because I'm mowing something, man. But when I first started going back to church in my early 30s, after being gone for about 13, 14 years, I went to the pastor, and this is before I knew anything about anything. I was just showing back up to church in my early 30s. I said, hey, I'd like to mow your grass. He's all, Father, deliver this man right now. <laughs> David, you understand it's summertime, right? Um, and it's a thousand degrees outside. But oh, I had got so much joy from doing it for the Lord. It was not a problem. I looked forward to it. Don't thank me. This was a privilege. So my point is, is that you've got passions. You've got things in you that the Lord has planted in you that you go, oh, I would love to do that. And most of us would go, that sounds like I'd rather have the flu than do some of that stuff. But that's how the body works. So here's what the church did. So they realize, okay, 10% are actively serving while 90% sit in chairs. It doesn't mean everybody's just terrible people. It could be a couple of things. And so they came up with an assessment to help their congregation determine what their gifts are and how to use them and create access points for people to say yes to Jesus in every area of their lives including this load-bearing wall. And so what they came up with is this thing called the SHAPE assessment. It's an acronym, and I'm going to go through them quickly, but look at this. They're like, okay, and I want you guys to take a picture of this because I want you this week to pray about these five different things and not, not like what should you do, but figure out how God has wired you. I think sometimes we think our destinies and our gifts and our callings, right? It's this big lofty thing. And we just go, how do I even get there? Guys, it's not that hard. It's a matter of going, God, what'd you wire me to do? And should, would you show me where to do it? There you go. But first off, it opens up by explaining you have spiritual gifts. We just saw in scripture, that's the reality, right? So when we receive, when we receive Christ, each and every one of us, the Bible says, we receive a gift, so if you know Jesus in faith for your salvation, you've been given a gift. The next thing would be your heart. What are you passionate about? Students, what are you passionate about? Is it drawing? Is it doing chores? Is it, is it using manners with your parents? What is the thing you're passionate about? What, you, what gets you up in the morning? If someone gave you a blank check, if God gave you a blank check and said, you could do whatever you want in your life and I will bless it, what would you write in that check? That's probably the area of passion that God has given you uniquely and specifically to do. Next thing is your abilities. Some of you, all of us actually, we all have natural abilities. I don't have a lot of them, but one of them that has been developed over 20 years is my ability to yell into microphones, okay? I didn't start out that way, but the truth is, is each and every one of us have abilities. So God is giving you actual things that we would never be able to do, but it's easy for you because you have a natural talent towards that. The next thing is your personality. How has God wired you? Like I shared in the first service, there's someone in here who most of us know because he met you at the door and did not let you go until you said hi back to him. His name is Brother Dwayne Norton. But here's the thing, and his beautiful wife, Karina, by the way. The secret sauce, honestly, behind this man is you, Miss Karina. But here's the thing. He, it's his personality. God has wired him to be that guy. I'm more like a cat. You can pet me every now and then, but you're going to have to give me space, okay? I'll use the litter box, 
but let me do my own thing. That is my wiring and my, just my natural wiring and personality. But God uses me just like he uses Dwayne, just like he wants to use you uniquely in your personality. There's some folks who maybe you don't have that much of a personality by culture standards. What I mean by that is maybe you're not an extrovert, you're not a conversationalist, you just kind of like doing your own thing. Could it be that's your personality and the Lord wired you specifically for that reason? Maybe you're supposed to be behind a computer screen looking at a spreadsheet because you're masterful at doing that and that's how you jam out and use your, your great. That's not even, that's not less spiritual than Dwayne. Last thing, experiences. <laughs> he and I are having our own conversation up here. But last thing is your experiences. And I think sometimes we want to run from the things that used to define us. And so we go, oh man, in the back, I had this wound. I had this issue take place or whatever those things are. We try to run from them or bury them or act like they didn't exist. But could it be that the Lord wants to take the ashes of your experiences and make something beautiful out of them? And that may actually contribute to your calling. What if God is able to redeem all things? The truth is, is he can and he does if we let him. So this is your shape. So as you take a picture of this, take some time with the Lord at the secret place this week and go, okay, this is a map for me. Then you can go to gofellowship.org and you click on something and then you click on something else <laughs> and you will find a gifts assessment that you can take. <laughs> Just poke around, you'll find it. I'll stick to preaching. <laughs> So, here's a couple of traps that I fell into when I was being called to step into ministry, okay? When I was called to, in, to step into ministry, these are three traps that I want to share with you because I've walked with them, but God's released my feet from them, but I want to talk about a couple of them because this is where you're going to stay in the land of 90% unless you overcome these traps and recognize them. The first trap that keeps you from using your gifts, guys, is the comparison trap, what I mean by that is this, where we look around at the people that maybe we align ourselves with or aspire to be like or use our gifts in a certain way, but then we go, oh, but I mean, look how talented they are. I'm not as talented as they are. So, you know, so what we do is we just go, oh, you know, there's no way I could be good using my gifts as that person. And we start going, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. Let the cooler, more educated people, the prettier ones, do the thing. And I'll just cheer them on. That's the comparison trap. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that that is part of your steps towards pursuing your destiny and your purpose and your calling and your gifts. God doesn't say, show me the verse where he says, be sure to compare yourself to everyone around you. Compare what you know about yourself to what you don't know about those other people. Nowhere in the Bible will you see that. The comparison trap is keeping a lot of us in our seats, and we're not fulfilling what God has called us to do. The next thing is the fear trap. Now, the fear trap says this. Whoa, hold on, hot shot. I know Pastor David really inspired you today, but let's not forget, you're not qualified. Hey, I'm glad you feel good, and you think God's given you a gift, and that's cute. But hey, you just need to slow your roll. You're not spiritual enough. You don't know enough of the Bible. How can you possibly use your gift in light of how you acted last Wednesday? And we go, yeah, that's true. And so we become fearful. And then we begin to debate against God when we do this, though. You want to see some examples? What we will start doing is we will start procrastinating. So we'll start going, uh, you know what? 2024, new year, new me. Dude, it's February. <laughs> what the heck are you thinking? I've been there, I get it. But fear will keep you in your seat. Moses, y'all heard of him before? Have any, has anybody ever heard of this guy named Moses in the old? <laughs> All right, I'm getting an assessment of where our hearts are and our, okay. I have a lot of new material to preach to you. Thank you. You just made my life easy. Um, Moses is this guy, and basically he was called by God, positioned by God to grow up in the palace of Pharaoh and all the rest of this stuff. He winds up losing his temper. He kills an Egyptian slave. He buries him in the sand. He gets found out. He lives for the next 40 years in the desert, and he thinks he's blown it, and it's over. 
God shows up, burning bush. Anybody familiar with this? Not, not the fireplace you just saw, a burning bush. And God shows up and says, hey, I'm not done with you. As a matter of fact, your calling and your gifts and your purposes are actually now, now that you've been refined by the wilderness, I'm now free to move within your life if you obey. So he says to Moses, look at this. He says, I want you to be my spokesperson, Moses. You're going to be my spokesperson. Look what, look what happened to Moses. He fell into the fear trap because he goes, oh, please, no. Oh, gosh, no. Oh, Lord, I'm not very good with words. I've never been. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a good talker now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied. My words get all tangled up is what he told God. Then the Lord asked Moses, he said, okay, I hear you. Let me ask you a question now. Moses, who makes people's mouths? I love the Lord. He's so good, isn't he? Who makes people's mouths? Who decides if people speak or don't speak? Hear or not hear? See or not see? Is it not I, the Lord Moses? Oh, son, I will be what? What does it say? With you. I will be what, church? With you as you speak. And I will instruct you in what to say. I think sometimes when we step out to use our gifts, we feel like we're on our own and we got to figure this out on our own power and try to be awesome on our own strength. And if you are, it's going to be a burden. It won't be a blessing because you're trying to do it on your own power. But God says, I want to be with you. I want to do this with you. God does not need any of us, by the way, guys. He does not need any of us. You know, like a take your child to work day? For those of you who have done that, we honor you today. We, we really do. Because you know what's going to happen if you haven't done this, right? You're going to bring your little one to work, and the first 12 minutes of your day will be awesome. You'll look cool to your kid. Wow, you can hit the green button on this machine and it flashes a light and it makes the same thing that's in there? That's called a copier? Yes, I get to use it all the time, any time I want, right? And the, wow, well then after 12 minutes, what's gonna happen? They're gonna start sticking their hands like in the, in the, in the box of you know, staples and they're gonna try to eat them, right? They're gonna run to the break room and they're gonna eat Billy Bob's lunch. By accident, right? They're going to be a mess. And actually, as a matter of fact, you're not going to get any work done, are you? You're going to be chasing this little one around just trying to protect the liabilities that are involved with doing this. Son, take your mouth off the fire, you know, extinguisher. Don't, you know, just weird stuff. Guys, can I tell you something? I'm the kid who puts his mouth on the fire extinguisher in the kingdom of God. You are the one who's wanting to eat staples. We're God's children. He does not need us. As a matter of fact, we slow him down on our best day. And yet, he still invites us into his work. That's what a good daddy does because he wants to teach us something. Not just how to step into our purpose, but to actually experience his love for us uniquely. When he says, come to work with me. This is what he's telling Moses, who is not, he's the last spokesperson. Anytime you look in scripture, guys, the ones who are most powerfully used by God are those who are the least qualified and overlooked, including Jesus, by the way, from man's perspective. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Nazareth, isn't this the one, isn't this Joseph's son, the carpenter? Overlooked. King David, overlooked. I mean, pick anybody. Overlooked. Unqualified, but God says otherwise. Students, maybe you feel like you're too young to do anything for God. But you know what? Some of you think, man, okay, once I grow up and I get married and I go to college and get a degree and I buy a minivan and I start wearing my pants too high, then I can start being used of God. But you know what? Jeremiah was faced, he was like an eighth, ninth grader. Seriously, 14, 15 years old. God goes to him, and this is what he says to him. He says, son, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Before you were born, I set you apart, and I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Oh, sovereign Lord, Jeremiah goes back. He's like, you've got the wrong guy. You've got the, no, 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 no. I, I, I can't speak for you. Why? Not because he gets tongue-tied. 
No one's going to take me serious, is what he's saying. He says, I'm too young. But the Lord replied, don't say that. I'm too young. Don't say that for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people. For why? He says, I will be with you. I will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Are you seeing a theme here? He says, I saw you before you were born. I numbered the days. I know what I positioned you for and I know what I created you to do. I will be with you. Don't argue with me. I know what I'm doing. Just say yes and take a step of obedience. Look at Gideon. Gideon's people were being terrorized by these people called the Midianites. They destroyed their country. And there's this conversation. Gideon is hiding in this wine press for his life. He's just trying to scrape together just enough food to survive. God shows up. He says, I want you to take on this army, Gideon, and you're going to defeat them. But he goes, but Lord... But dad, but mom, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? That's so absurd. He's like, my clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the weakest in the weakest tribe. There's none weaker than I. The Lord said to him, look what it says. Say it. The Lord said to him, you see a trend here? The character of God is consistent. So anytime we mischaracterize God and say, that's not true for me, we do not know him because his promises are faithful and his character is consistent. This, he's saying this to you guys and me. I will be with you. Father, what do you want me to preach this week? I don't know what to preach you as it relates to this. Son, I will be with you. I'm, I'm living this out currently. He is with me. I love him. I love him. And he says, and you're going to destroy these Midianites as if you're fighting against one man. And so each time God said back, yeah, congratulations, you're right. You're, you don't have what it takes. But in me, you can do all things. And I'm here to tell you the exact same thing, church. So you take off the bracelet of fear, the trap of fear around your foot. But then we're going to take one more look at one other thing. This is nerve-wracking and intimidating for many of us to think of the idea to begin to take steps towards what God has stirred in our hearts to do. I understand that. Let me give you an example of why I say that. I'm the poster child for what I'm talking about. The reason why I could preach this sermon to you is because I've lived it. What you don't, many of you don't know is I was raised as a pastor's kid. Some of you know the story, some of you don't, but I was raised in a church, Baptist church. I grew up in there. I was there seven days a week from zero to age 17, my dad left ministry. When he left ministry, I was like, see ya, suckers. <laughs> I'm not joking. I hate to put it that way. But if you want honest this morning, peace. <laughs> and the reason why is because I was tired of hanging out with a bunch of fake people. I was tired of people just focusing on the exterior and not the interior of a person. It just felt like this is not good for me. And let's all be honest, sleeping in on a Sunday morning is the sweetest day of the week. Let's be, come on now. You know it was a battle for some of y'all and some of y'all are watching online right now because you went to St. Mattress instead of to Great Oaks. But I get it. I, I get it. But here's what happened. 13 years passed by and I didn't go to church. Until I had a near-death experience, and I found myself in the ER. They couldn't stabilize me. My heart was doing everything it should not be doing. And I thought I was going to die, and so did they. And I laid on my back in the ER. Hour after hour, they couldn't stabilize me. And I realized I'm not going to see the sunset today. My son was five at the time. And there's two thoughts that crossed my mind. And the first one was this. I, I don't know if I know God I think I just know about him. I know a lot of facts about him, but I don't think that that's relationship. And I said, Lord, if you get me out of this, I want to know what it means to really know you and not just about you. The other thing I realized in that moment, guys, in moments of reflection, when you're facing the reality of maybe you're going to die today, I can't tell you that the hollow, empty feeling that I've never felt like this before in my life, but I was like, I wasted my life. 
I did good things. I did cool things. But I missed my shot. Some of you are missing your shot. You have one life. Leave it all on the table. Leave it all on the field and get after what God's put in you. When I prayed, spoiler alert, I lived, right? <laughs> but when the Lord, as soon as I prayed that, immediately I was healed. Like, I mean, I'm not joking. I got off that ER table. I started going to church. My son David was five, like I said. We started showing up consistently. I volunteered to mow the grass. And I felt that that was enough. I felt like that I was doing what God called me to do. But there was this tall Texan guy who sold insurance who was about 15 years older than I. Isn't it funny how the church, when you come here, you'll interact with people you would never normally interact with in your normal life. God just puts us together because we're family. Well, he was this tall old insurance sales guy. And he's like, <clears throat> he had a real deep voice. I'm going to try to do my best, Kyle. He went, um, <clears throat> you remember Kyle Donahue, don't you guys? Uh, <clears throat> uh, David, um, I think you'd make a good youth pastor. I said, what? I was like, no, dude, no, I wouldn't. I, I'm telling you, I wouldn't. Not because I was right. I didn't, couldn't see it. I didn't see the gift in me. He's like, but he wouldn't let it go. And then God started not letting it go. And I'm like, God, I don't talk good. I'm the weakest of the weak. I'm too old is what I was saying because now I'm in my mid-30s. Are you stepping into youth ministry? That's a suicide mission at that age. Are you kidding me? The smell from those kids alone at that age is enough to kill you. The smell of corn nuts and Axe body spray? Give it a shot. My point is this. I just showed up. And I was like, God, I cannot believe you would want me to do this, but I think you, if you want me to do this, he said, David, I will be with you. I don't know how to preach. I have no education, guys. Congratulations, you have an uneducated pastor. I have no seminary. I don't even know how to spell seminary. <laughs> but here's the truth. I wanted to be obedient. And I was like, I'm going to have to depend upon God. But I, how do you preach? How do you write a sermon? I didn't know. Three months later, I went to this conference. I put my name in the hat to, before a drawing. And guys, I learned how to preach off of sermons I won in a contest. <laughs> I'm not joking with you. I formed my sermons just like I did off of those that I won in 2004. Okay? My point is, is that the Lord developed in me the ability to use my gifts. But fear and comparison were horribly just, just racking me. But I said yes, and I want to encourage you to do the same. So here's what I would tell you. Our gifts are often wrapped in opportunities. We're going to be afraid to take, y'all. Don't think this is going to be easy on the front end. You're actually going to have to trust the Lord. You're actually going to have to say yes and take a step and trust that he will be with you. But the last one is the guilt trap. What keeps us from serving God is because we feel like we've disqualified ourselves from serving God. Because we see our history, we see our choices, we see the things we struggle with today, and we go, I am disqualified from this. But I want to remind you of God's word if this is you. I felt the same way. And that's fine until you run up to Romans 11 where it says this. Son and daughter of God, I declare this over your life right now because some of you, this is going to be the turning point right here for you. The God's gifts and his call on your life, guys, can never be withdrawn. So if that's true, then it's no longer about qualification or disqualification. It's about your obedience. We don't own the results of our obedience. We own our obedience, though. And if God has given you a gift, he has not built the church around 10%. He's called each and every one of you to step in, to faithfully serve him, to be a blessing to us and for the glory of God. So here's one little bonus extra before we get out of here. Our gifts, guys, though, are not our identity. I want you to understand what I'm saying. They are expressions of Christ's identity within us. Everybody look to me. 
Everybody look to me because I want you to hear this because this is where a lot of people get strung up and they get really messed up and they start acting entitled or they start acting whatever. It's because they think their gift and their calling is who they are. I was just talking to someone recently, good hearted, but the individual said, my identity isn't what I do for God. And I said, I understand what you mean, but that's not true. That's, that's the farthest thing from the truth. The reason why I'm not a preacher I'm not a pastor. I'm not a husband. I'm not a friend. You know what I am? One thing, I'm a child of God. That's my identity. Now, how that identity is expressed can be a thousand different ways. But I had to get to a point where the Lord brought me to a point right before I became your pastor. And I learned all I've ever wanted is just to know him and to be loved by him. If I, if that, that's not, that's the best to be called a child of God, guys. And from that understanding that my position is not my identity, my preaching is not who I am. These are expressions of Christ's identity within me uniquely. That's how this works. If you don't understand this, you will have an overinflated sense of self-importance. You will think the world will rise and fall on your giftedness, and that is idolatry. You've made an idol out of the calling on your life instead of knowing that you're just a son and a daughter, that God has invited you in to work, okay? So it's not what you do for him. It's who he says you are. That's your identity. I want you to look at this picture as we finish up. This is exactly what the load-bearing wall looks like in the house of God. It's a beautiful, funky mosaic, and every single piece of glass is assembled together perfectly to create a complete thought and expression, right? And within that, there's different shapes, different colors, different all sorts of, you're unique, but this is what the church should look like. But guess what? The beauty is not in the, the, the glass and the way it's arranged. The beauty actually shows up when what happens when the light shines behind it and illuminates that glass. That's when you can see the full expression of the colors and the unique shapes and the designs it casts on the room when the light shines on it. This is what the kingdom of God looks like, y'all. If you're still having a hard time making a connection to the illustration, that's us. The Holy Spirit is what illuminates you uniquely and beautifully. Amen. That's who you are. That's it. I ain't got nothing more to say. I'm done. <laughs> so what do I do now, Dave? Pray and walk out those back doors on the back porch. And there's a handful of tables out there that the Lord wants to maybe direct you to today to go, okay, I'm not trained. I'm not qualified. I don't know what to do. Guys, our job is to equip you for the work of ministry. So don't worry about that. Own your obedience and sign up and start serving the body so we're not a bunch of 10 percenters in here. Let's be 100 percenters because we're, God's 100 percent into us. But maybe you're sitting here today and you can relate to the idea or the, what my story when I said, I didn't know God. I just knew a lot about him. I didn't know what my purpose was, but I know that I'd missed it. And maybe you can relate to that part of my story. But I want to tell you, next year I will have served 20 years in ministry because God gave me another shot. And today God has appointed you. If he's ordered your days, he has appointed each and every one of us in here to say yes to him and start walking in the fullness of our purpose. But he's also called some of you in here because today is the day that he wrote that you would hear the gospel and become a child of God. This is the day for you. Today is the day of your salvation. And so this morning, if you want to be saved, the Bible says that you can't earn it. It is simply by saying please and thank you. And we receive the gift of grace and forgiveness. And so if you want to be saved, if you want to be made a child of God, the Bible says that salvation is so easy to understand that even a child can get it. He's not going to make this hard for you to say yes to him. But if you want to know Jesus, would you bow your heads and pray with me right now? The prayer doesn't save you, okay? But if you don't know what to say, pray with me to God who's listening, who wants to make you a child just like he did for me. Talk to him right now in faith and just say, dear Jesus, 
there's power in your name. I admit that I'm a sinner. But right now, with the faith that you've given me, I put it in you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose from the grave on the third day. Just tell him in faith. So now say to him, please save me. Please cleanse me. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I make you the Lord and boss of my life. Awaken my purpose as your child in Jesus' name. And if you just prayed this, Jesus just said yes to you. He did. That's what the Bible says. And we make a big deal out of that, but we're not going to embarrass you. But at the count of three, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time in your life this morning, we want to celebrate it and we want to give you a copy of your own Bible and cheer you on as a new brother and sister in the house of God, called and purposed. If you prayed at the count of three, just put your hand up. One, two, three. If you just prayed that this morning, in this moment, put your hand up. Is that a hand raise back there? Okay, that's cool. It's cool, man. Don't be, don't be shy. Who else? Is there anybody else in here? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? I told you when we we're going to make you do anything. We're, would you stand to your feet? Ma'am, I just want to let you know that the Lord kept highlighting you to me the whole time I was talking. I could see the Holy Spirit working in your life. And so he loves you, and he loves you wherever you are, sir, back there. New life in the house. All right, I got to shut up. We got to get out of here. All right. Father, would you seal what you did in our hearts today? We want to thank you for promising to be with us in all things. Liberate your people, God. Show them the path that they should go. And may it be said in your book of our lives, we were faithful today. May we learn how to say yes to you in every area of our life, Jesus. And we ask these things and we all said together, amen. I love you. I love you. I love you. I'll see y'all next week.